Welcome to a new episode of the Unicorn Bakery. My name is Fabian Tausch, and today we're going to take a look at Razor's recipe for success. The Razor Group buys, or started to buy, Amazon FBA businesses. By now, it feels a bit more like you're buying FBA aggregators, like yep. other uh, companies that did the same that you did in the beginning. And you consolidate them and build a group of e-commerce brands. As you as a listener might know, these aggregator models were very hyped during 2020 and 2021. Then the cost of capital um, came up and now it feels like a bit the, of the anti-hype mm -hmm. um, at the moment. And therefore, I'm very happy to discuss with Razor Group founder Tusha Aluwalia the good and bad sides of building and scaling, rapidly scaling during a hype cycle and the future of Amazon aggregator businesses and a lot more. You started in 2020. Funny enough, in the backyard of my studio's address here in Berlin. That's also That's true. how yeah. we met. You raised more than a billion dollars in funding. Recently acquired Perch to become the la largest aggregator measured by revenue. And you have approximately 450 people working at the Razor Group. Tusha. Welcome back to the origin of Razor and welcome to the Unicorn Bakery. Thank you, Fabian, for having uh, me. And, uh, it, you know, gives me a lot of old memories coming back into the building. Uh, and uh, as we just discussed, uh, remember the early days at Razor Group, uh, which have been quite intense. And everybody loves to think about those those uh, those moments. Um, and so I hope, uh, you know, this will give us some good luck and energy for this podcast. It's not even four years ago that you that you started, so it's been a hell of a ride, like from one of the most hyped companies in Berlin to one of the most like um, anti-hyped co <laughs> companies in Berlin, I guess. <laughs> it's a very nice word. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm not the person to, yeah, yeah. to uh, make headlines here, yeah. so how would you describe uh, the, the last, last four years? years? Um, intense. Um, I think, uh, you know, you've... Uh, going through different cycles, going through, um, you know, the good moments, the tough moments, um, and uh, moving forward, uh, I think has been um, extremely, um, I'd say, um, helpful to, I'd say, also develop as a human being and uh, with, with all of the team members. Um, you know, it probably was as extreme as you think, so... You said it's uh, probably as extreme as I and all the listeners would think. Uh, what would you say are the, the good parts about scaling as fast as you did? I mean, you, as I said, you raised a billion in capital. I'm not sure if all is equity or if that is combined yeah. equity and well, we across uh, equity, equity dollars and, and debt dollars. You know, I think, you know, as, as we discussed right now, I don't know if it's really a dilemma. Uh, whether you know you can say it was good or it was bad it was just a, a choice that we uh, that we took uh, to to build that business. Uh, we were excited about the business. We are still excited about the business, um, and so that's a path we we went down. We had access to that capital, um, and so you know once we have chosen that path, uh, we embrace that path. Um, so and that path comes with benefits. Um, it comes with disadvantages for. Uh, founders in terms of control, um, but it comes with benefits of having very smart people um, that you build a, a business together with, um, and um, it, it allows you to to build defining companies uh, in in a much more um, rapid way. So I think you know comes with both advantages and, and disadvantages. But again, I think the the team, the founding team uh, that has eventually went on to build uh, uh, Razor also over the last couple of quarters and, and years, is a founding team that I'd say is more in the venture bucket, right? So this is our DNA. Uh, we want to build large companies. Um, we want to make a difference. Um, you know, we, we, are, we don't want to flip shit or, you know, we want to build an institution um, that's meaningful in size and something great. And I think you can do that um, much better uh, with... Um, I'd say the ecosystem supporting you um, to, to build such an institution, a large business. So uh, for us, I think it was never a choice. Do we build Razor Group that way or this way? And obviously it's a capital-led model, um, but we were always inclined to build something with the venture or 
um, capital ecosystem in Berlin uh, together, and that's what we did. Let's talk about the founding team. I mean, I think it was easy to foresee that this will be a hell of a ride, but I'm not sure if it's it's foreseeable, like how crazy it will be, like yeah. how quickly, how like everything that happens. But you decide for what you want to build. Who do you pick as the founding team? What made the in quotation marks, perfect Razor founding team? So for me, you know, and I chose uh, a lot of the, the co-founders to, um, get, you know, be on this journey with. One of the most important things for me is that there is some sort of loyalty between uh, founding team members because obviously I've been building businesses before that. So I'm not a first-time founder. Um, my last business that I built in India Uh, um, and you know, I, I was in India for for a long time. Although I I was born raised in, in Düsseldorf, Germany, um, you know, gave me some insight and some experience. Um, and one of those insights is that you know there are tough moments um, as as you build a business, um, whether you want it or not, right? Uh, so building a business um, that scales fast and the business that that kind of business that we built. Um, it's clear that, you know, there will be extreme highs and there'll be some lows that you'll need to tackle. And um, having a team that can fully trust each other, um, I think is a prerequisite. Um, I think, um, and I think the, this is sort of the the DNA of the team. So that, you know, sort of loyalty on one end, loyalty, trust, um, big trust, near blind trust almost, right? But within sort of, um, you know, not completely blind trust. Obviously, you need to you need to see that you know you do everything, uh, but by the book. But like very very heavy duty to trust uh, and loyalty on the one end, and then on the other side, what has really helped us is complementarity of uh, skill set. So we are not sort of the same skill set at all. Um, so it's not like we have three people from McKinsey, or everybody studied at VAU, or everybody studied at Tom, um, and so now that's sort of the boxed founding team that is amazing and you can, you know, let's go and, and, and we roll with that. In fact, you know, you have different personalities uh, such as Shreshta, uh, who, I, who I know from my time in India. She's a Stanford computer science alumna, so handles a lot of the technology uh, in our business, which has been a key competitive advantage of ours. You have Chris Gamon, uh, who, who I know through the Rocket Internet ecosystem. So I worked within the Rocket ecosystem, uh, uh, obviously, previously. Um, and so he is sort of more of a banker kind of personality type um, or of an Excel guy. Shreshta is more of a Python person. Um, and you have Oli, who I know from my high school in Dusseldorf, uh, who, who is a physicist. Um, and so everybody comes sort of with, with different traits, different personalities. Um, and sort of we're able to work well with each other. And I think that has been defining Uh, for us as we maneuvered different episodes uh, in our young uh, history. We are, I think, three and a half years old uh, now, uh, but obviously have seen quite the extremes uh, with 2021 and then a complete flip in, in market, in macroeconomics. Um, and so maneuvering uh, that period um, has been possible because of a strong team that is both very, very trusting with each other and has a complementarity and, and skill set so you can handle different things simultaneously so that has been I think that worked well uh, for us and that's what what I looked for uh, as I put together the team these are all people that I know for ages uh, Oli I know from high school Shreshta I know from uh, my time in India um, and uh, Chris I know through the rocket internet ecosystem so I think there's always some there's always been some history with uh, with the people that have then Uh, chosen to to work with and who have also chosen to work with me um, and I think that has been instrumental uh, in, in forming the founding team that we have take me through some of the first days I mean you had the founding team so you're not a solo founder you didn't have to do any everything on your own it's like you had a team uh, you could split up um, the the tasks you needed capital and you wanted to buy Uh, companies that were running on Amazon FBA. So how 
Like, did you start creating deal flow while you were fundraising? Were you fundraising first? Like, how was the first, how were the first steps going to create momentum to then also being able to, uh, like, figuring out, okay, what businesses do we want to buy? Where do we get the money from? How many businesses are we going to buy for phase one until we need to raise another round? Yeah. I, the truth is, I think a lot of the um, early stage investors and supporters and angels um, that we ended up partnering with were folks that you know I knew um, and I was in touch with. So they were part of the ecosystem. So it's not like I cold called them. Um, there was an existing relationship. And um, so you had sort of the existing relationship with early stage capital also early stage capital that was excited to work with me and I was excited to to work with them um, on the one hand. And then on the other hand, you obviously had sort of, um, you know, the, the team, you had sort of um, our interest in building something in consumer um, on the other hand. So it was, I'd say, it was not sort of this romantic piece where, you know, I woke up and said, hey, I have a idea in the middle of the night and, uh, you know, uh, I think I'm going to build this big aggregator. And it was definitely not that case. But I think there were a couple of components that came together. One is, and that I'm speaking mid-2020, um, I knew e-commerce. Uh, I've had large e-commerce businesses before and ran uh, large e-commerce businesses before. Um, I had an ecosystem uh, that was keen to uh, do something um, together with me, both on uh, the co-founder side and uh, on the capital side. And then you uh, sort of obviously had market signals um, that, that at that point uh, were validating uh, the the largest player. Of course, today we are the largest player. Um, and that sort of putting putting that sort of mix together um, allowed us to then kick off in, I'd say, August 2020. Um, and that's sort of how the coming about of Razor Group has happened. That was uh, sort of... Um, you know, both um, existing relationships, a little bit of idea, a little bit of luck, a little bit of, you know, let's do it. Um, and so that then propelled us to to start the business in August of 2020. How many businesses have you bought by now? When we say, when we talk about um, you as a razor group buying single brands like FBA businesses. Yeah. And then also ending the single businesses that uh, other aggregators that you acquired had on? So I, I would really, you know, and, you know, you wanted to speak a little bit about um, sort of the the backdrop of macroeconomic factors. And so I'd really say there, you know, there are two razor groups. Um, mm -hmm. One is, I'd say, the pre-2022 uh, razor group or pre-2021 razor group um, that was a product of the market environment then. And then there is, I'd say, a post-2022 Razor Group. And the strategy has, I'd say, has been quite different uh, in those different phases, uh, which is a pure function of how markets have behaved. Uh, and so in, in financial markets, but also consumer markets, right? And so we were in, we are in the intersection uh, of, of, of the two. Um, I'd say Razor 1.0 was a lot about you know, was a classic buy and build strategy, uh, but for the internet. So it was sort of, you know, 50% uh, internet, 50% private equity uh, kind of setup where you took on acquisition capital um, and used that acquisition capital to deploy um, in acquisitions of these FBA merchants. And FBA merchants uh, were particularly attractive um, because obviously um, they're, very easy to um, sort of operate. They're not as complex. A lot of the operational complexity is taken away by Amazon, who handle your logistics, who handle your e-commerce operations. And so you can very easily, you know, acquire many of many of those uh, FBA businesses, unlock synergies, uh, and, and operate these businesses. And so I'd say this together with I'd say a, a, a COVID-induced um, uh, tailwind for these businesses together with, uh, I'd say, a low interest rate regime, a ZERP environment, uh, provided sort of a perfect breeding ground uh, for sort of this, 
aggressive buy and build uh, strategy where you know you saw many players uh, pop up and um, um, raise acquisition capital to buy these businesses and operationalize them. I'd say that is sort of aggregator 1.0. And obviously, sort of markets changed in 22, uh, quite tremendously so. Um, and so, which we obviously in hindsight regard as the perfect storm, wherein um, on the uh, capital side, you know, th things flipped. Um, I think one of the reasons uh, was probably the post-COVID period that came with sort of supply shocks and supply shocks together with sort of a lot of cash that was with consumers, um, you know, triggered, uh, you know, m massive uh, uh, um, sort of uh, inflationary pressures. Um, and as a consequence, central banks had to react and sort of increase interest rates. So there was sort of a perfect storm. Many, many things happened. In 2022, interest rates increased, consumer multiples uh, got compressed. Um, you know, there were supply chain shocks uh, on the consumer side. Um, you had a, you you're coming out of post-COVID, and so you're comparing to a COVID period, and so it was uh, was an interesting period. And so all of these companies that sort of were operating under the assumption of a 2021 environment were faced with a, a crazy macroeconomic dramatic shift in macroeconomic uh, in, in macros and macroeconomic uh, um, elements. Um, and so as a consequence, you know, we realized that the path forward for us is not this traditional roll-up, uh, but really focusing on consolidating smaller players and other players who collectively are experiencing the same headwinds. And so that is when we shifted our focus of what we want to acquire, um, which was essentially other players. And so what you see Razor Group acquire since the second half of 2022 are our peers, starting with uh, Factory 14, um, then Valorio, who was the, the leader in, in Latin America, the Strice Group, which I think was the second or, or third largest player in, uh, in Berlin, uh, and that's now culminating, obviously, in the acquisition of Perch. Um, and so, really, you know, when we speak about Razor Group, we need to see sort of there is a 2021 Razor Group um, that has then emerged from a 2022 um, environment as sort of the consolidator of consolidators. That's sort of um, what we, you know, how, how, how I think about it, how, how um, the, the people at Razor Group think about it. How did your role as a leader change before and after the market dynamic changed? I think, you know, the, the role has always, you know, been, has always been changing with the rapid scale. So, you know, um, as a small business, you know, obviously, uh, you know, I was much, much more uh, hands-on. I'm still very hands-on, um, but obviously as, as things change and there's so much change in the organization driven by external factors, um, you know, I think the, the people aspect becomes increasingly important um, and managing the, the different stakeholders um, to, to make sure that everybody's aligned on, on the vision, on where we are headed, and so execution doesn't suffer. And so, you know, my... my uh, sort of role was very different in different quarters, uh, I'd say. So um, a lot of the time that I spent, for example, in the last three, four quarters was making sure strategic uh, deals such as the Perch uh, deal deal happen. Um, and, you know, there are stakeholders involved that I need to work with to make sure that, you know, that transaction was a successful one for Razor Group, which, is w which it was and ended up being. Um, so a lot of the time, I'd say, in the last couple of quarters was really on, on the... Um, uh, strategic uh, M&A side. Um, it'll continue to to be more on, I'd say, strategic deals. Um, but obviously, as I look over the next couple of quarters, you know, a, a lot of focus will also be on, you know, operations, executions, um, and also getting in the right talent um, to make sure uh, the company continues to to raise a hand in progress and, and grows fast. I will ask you about the Perch deal a bit later, but... Um... Before, I think we need to understand um, the dynamic a bit better of why those other aggregators wanted or needed to sell. Like, yeah, because I think it's very clear that 
um, we're turning from a good cash environment to a not good cash environment yeah. for for cash heavy businesses and you but things are improving now again uh, I again think, yeah know, but bitcoin we, is going up again after, <laughs> like, oh, that's a good uh, talking talking <laughs> yeah. 2022 that you already mentioned and described very well yeah one of the underlying hypotheses of uh, these aggregator models was okay we're buying uh, cash efficient businesses that are yeah. profitable and we are able to build out more and more synergies that's that means we can run them with um or, or put yeah. them together have them even more margin and then run a business a business that's like worthwhile yeah what happened to the aggregators that you bought for example before i answer that question there's one thing that i really need to say which is that i'm not a fan of the word aggregator um Obviously, I understand we we are now bucketed in in that uh, or all companies that have emerged from I'd say this credit led M and A cycle in 2021 are called aggregators, but aggregation is not a business. Uh, aggregation is a strategy. It's an inorganic strategy wherein you acquire other businesses, uh, but you know it it's not the sole or the the purpose of your business. It's not the consumer of your business. You know, your target company that you acquire is not your customer. Your customer is the end consumer. It's the customer that is buying your product. What's so the specific we, question that they... Do we, do we call it consoli consolidator then, or what's the better word? That for, for Razor Group? You know, we're, um, I'd say, you know, the we're probably a, a product-led um, e-commerce um, powerhouse. That's probably... Well, how you know how how I would call it, uh, because obviously, our history has been a lot of roll up, um, and our DNA and our capabilities are obviously very good in the M and A, and also now in the consolidation complex M and A structuring, uh, in on the deal side. But our future, um, and our present, is creating amazing consumer products, because this is sort of you know the 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 future of um, our business obviously you know m a will always be close uh, as an engine um as an engine for for growth for inorganic growth um but what's the real world delta that we generate um beyond just m a right uh, what's the real world impact um and the real world impact is and has to be making consumers lives better by you know um but by by providing better consumer products the question was, yeah. um, what made it so hard for all the other companies yeah. that bought Amazon FBA businesses to survive? Is it the cost of capital? Is it because it's harder to run and consolidate those businesses? Um, what are the points that, for example, a perch and also others were selling to you? You know, I think there are two elements. I think Razor is incredibly uh, good at the, its technology infrastructure uh, and, and operationalizing our bet to very early on have somebody like Tresha and our team um, who, who has worked with, an, I'd say, top tier, uh, uh, with top tier talent to, to build out the automation use cases, the automation stack, as we say, to be able to scale a, businesses, a business such as ours because obviously it's incredibly complex to operate so many different products and so many different SKUs that you have ingested through m a and making sort of the trains run on time. I think that has really helped us uh, to position uh, ourselves as sort of the, the prime candidate for consolidation. Second, I'd say the market environment obviously also pushed players to consider uh, m a and consolidation and specifically, you know, it's probably, um, you know, all of the items that I explained uh, right now, all of the above. So whether that's, you know, interest rates, whether that's sort of um, uh, outlook on the operations of their own uh, portfolios um, and, and the businesses that they have operated um, to consider consolidating and, and selling to Razor Group. And the third is obviously, you know, in a phase like this uh, where markets have shifted 180 degrees, you know, scale is an important factor. Because it has, you know, many repercussions in terms of, um, uh, you know, your ability to maneuver uh, the current market environment. So I think these three reasons uh, would, you know, then lead uh, these uh, businesses to, to um, you know, join hands with, with Razor Group um, 
in obviously you know investors in these companies already also know um and you know i think everybody in the ecosystem knows each other and so you know these elements would have um ensured that uh, you know those transactions then eventually happen as they did right uh, knowing that those are all the reasons why i would decide for razor i think the the main question still is why do i have to decide for for another uh company because if i would be profitable mm -hmm. and i'm running a profitable company yeah no matter how many brands i call it what, yeah. what makes me sell this company because you're not profitable uh, i mean what because you're profitable at ebitda but you're not profitable at net income right so i think What goes missing in, in, in these discussions right now is obviously capital structure. These companies have debt. And uh, obviously debt that is more, um, pr probably that's better in the 2021 environment uh, versus in a 2022 environment, right? So I think a lot of the, the debt uh, that was raised in, in a 2021 environment from a 22 environment is very expensive, Um And that leads these companies, together with the you know headwinds on the consumer side, um, to essentially embrace an opportunity like consolidation. So, in some scenarios, you know, it's a choice where, uh, sorry, uh, companies see it coming and they say, "Look, this is probably the strategically better option to go with." And in some scenarios that that we also executed on was not really a choice. Right, so for 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 the selling company, so you know it's 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 the market environment, and so how does the market environment affect? You know, maybe that question is sort of remains unanswered. How does the market environment affect these companies that you know marketed themselves as profitable companies to um, to sell? Well, because they may be profitable on the on the P and L up until EBITDA level, but obviously there is a big interest line item, right? What what probably burn rate is for traditional VC, I say traditional VC, VC-backed companies, for us would be sort of how much interest do we pay? And that's sort of the uh, the, the comparison. And so they uh, evaluate that option quite strongly. And that is obviously driven by the massive shift in interest rates. Um, and that is essentially then because of the items that, that I discussed, technology, size, and scale, and then also trust from, I'd say, the, the key investor base that is also driving some of that consolidation um, benefits Razor Group. Also benefits the target company, right? Because, you know, some t in, some, in some cases, you know, they have to, have to do a transaction such as this. Important dynamic to understand for everybody yeah. listening. So I yeah. think because that's often misunderstood and even... Like I have friends who are very deeply in this FBA space, and even I sometimes have um, issues wrapping my hand around this. So therefore, happy happy to. Uh, so a ask. lot of the a lot of the music um, post twenty twenty one in 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 our industry is happening on the balance sheet, uh, not necessarily on the uh, P and L, right? So I e balance sheet, I e sort of um, you know what's your capital structure, you know. Um, What is, you know, how exposed are you to, uh, you know, leverage? Um, and that is driving a lot of the um, uh, consolidation discussion. What is emerging out of this, obviously, is a clearing of the market. So I'd say this consolidation would have happened anyways, right? But probably if interest rates didn't change as dramatically as they have, it would have taken another 10 years. So what would have happened in 10 years is now essentially happening um, within a couple of quarters. Um, and, and that will lead to, I'd say, a more consolidated space. Um, I think, you know, there will be one or two big leaders uh, like, like Razor Group, I'd say, in uh, quarters from now. Um, Razor Group will definitely be one of them. We are the largest today. Um, and maybe there will be some niche players. But in the long term, and, you know, if we move... There are always two tracks when I speak. There's track one, the capital track, which, you know, sorry, we, we speak about M&A, we speak about raising debt, we speak about 2021, we speak about the markets change, we speak about consolidation, we speak about, you know, balance sheet versus P&L. 
that is sort of the capital track. The other track um, that is obviously incredibly success defining uh, for players in 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 our uh, industry is the consumer track, right? Um, so, what's the real world difference that we make? How do we make consumers' lives better, right? Um, because, you know, just doing M and A into infinity uh, is not where this business is is uh, is headed. Um, Again, M and A will be a capability, but you know, the real world delta um, will happen uh, for consumers by building better consumer products. And you know, happy to dive deeper on what what you know what I we'll mean get to that point. when <laughs> when I say that. Um, but that's sort of how you how you have to think about um, the business, and that's what will drive the consolidation, right? So when I'm, when we speak about consolidation, M and A, us now consolidating the market, that's a consequence of how capital structures were formed in 2021 and how markets shifted in 2022 and our response and our foresight uh, to be very early as a founding team um, in communicating, we need to consolidate um, to emerge as champions. Because before, I'd say most of the players would say, oh, aggregators, it's not winner takes all. Um, It's sort of, you know, you can build your profitable thing and, you know, uh, you know, it's not a race, but I'd say the change in the market environment has made it into winner takes most, um, because I'd say the, you know, having a, a scale and you know having all of the items that that we discussed, technology scale, buy-in from uh, the 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 investor base um, is, I'd say, defining in uh, charting out uh, a successful path ahead. Um, and so I'd say it's it's when it takes most now for for sure. And so I think for all of those reasons, you know, I think smaller players are compelled uh, to um, evaluate very strongly uh, whether a consolidation makes sense. Um, and if there is a win-win structure that these businesses can find with a player like Razor Group, probably among the very few, if not the only player to continue to execute on transactions such as these. When you say leverage is one of the important things to observe at the moment, how exposed is the Razor Group to leverage? So, of course, Razor Group is also exposed to leverage. Uh, you know, we raised a lot of debt. Um, um, so did, you know, many of the large players, uh, including, you know, um, Perch Group that 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 we acquired. And so our sort of the, the the conclusion of this entire capital story is obviously the consolidation. And part of the consolidation strategy is obviously to, um, you know, work with uh, the the uh, investors on the, I'd say, debt side of the business uh, to, um, you know, see how we can improve uh, leverage and capital structure. Uh, with these M and A's, so one you know one um, logic and one driver for these consolidation transactions. So we also benefit from consolidation transactions. We are not doing you know everybody and anybody a favor and saying ah okay you know we're the white knight. Please come and uh, and you know we'll acquire you. Uh, obviously, our benefit, um, our advantage, and and you know water. And so again. That's the capital track of the business, uh, capital structure, M&A. So that means the money that they raised in debt that was still left, yeah, that was flipped into your equity? Or... Exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly. And so that improved our capital structure, that improved our ratios, our leverage ratios, um, and uh, essentially built a much more stable um, platform that's that's ready for the future. And so when we speak about consolidation, you know, it. what is driving consolidation? Obviously, us being the better operator, um, I think the, the, the tech piece, uh, we also speak about capital structure, um, enhancements, improvements to capital structure. Uh, we are smart structuring of deals. Um, and also, obviously, revenue synergies and synergies um, in total. Obviously, you know, one plus one equals three here. So... Um, you know, these are all of the reasons why it makes a ton of sense uh, in in um, an environment like this. Uh, 
you know, to focus on consolidation. We've successfully done that. And, you know, that's been probably the reason we are now on, on, um, a, a very positive trajectory, uh, despite sort of, uh, you know, what the sentiments that, that you referred to, uh, to the aggregator space are right now. One question for my understanding, because I just never thought about this, but so you have, you generally have the cap table of Perch. So mm -hmm. when you're merging or you're buying um, Perch, um, probably uh, due to the circumstances with uh, shares as well, they, the cap table merges into your cap table. So they mm -hmm. get shares at the, on the, at, of the Razor Group. If I then flip the debt into Razor Equity, mm -hmm. it's so that you don't have the to pay back the money to the people who who um yeah lended it to to perch but they become also oh, like part of the cap table they become partners in oh, crime okay essentially yeah. so, so they're, just, they're, they're, just they to become, understand. so i'd say the um the 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 debt providers in perch are now part of the razor equity they think like equity they want to build a large business um you know They are. Um, they obviously know the space very well um, because they're deployed in many, many different companies. Um, and um, from from their perspective, I think it's very important to to have a large outcome and a successful outcome. Um, and so that's how they're thinking, um, and that's how they're supporting the business. And you know, I think that's one of the key advantages uh, that Razor Group has, uh, which is to have sort of the, you know, lenders as partners kind of tagline. I think that is, that's one of the, the key advantages uh, that, that we have post the purchase transaction now. Um, and um, I think strategically that will open uh, a couple of doors for us, hopefully in the future. What are other um, comments that you can openly make about the purge acquisition? <clears throat> so, you know, what I'm excited about is, um, you know, Perch as a business is easily digestible. Um, it is mostly focused on Amazon US. It's quite large in scale. It's a uh, bit, you know, they have the business is, I'd say, very uh, well run, professionally run. And so our ability to integrate that business um, has been, um, is, is pretty. Uh, pretty great. Um, so it's pretty easy to integrate. I think that's point one. Point two, you know, there have been has been some really good talent at Perch. Uh, you know, Razor obviously also has great talent, but, uh, you know, we are excited to work with um, some of the key talent uh, at Perch, um, some of whom are part of Razor leadership now. Um, and, uh, you know, they have, I'd say, from a cultural perspective, <clears throat> Sorry, from a cultural perspective, they have thought about the future and sort of our business in a similar way, um, like Razor Group, as as we have, and so that has made the meeting of the minds, uh, I'd say, between different stakeholders. You know, uh, a purchase former CEO, uh, myself, um, and and the wider leadership, very smooth. Um, so I'm excited about that. Um, The the thing that I'd say was possibly, <clears throat> you know, that we have to sort of um, grapple with a little bit, obviously, is is the two location piece. You have now uh, many people in in uh, Berlin and and Boston, and so uh, you know, working working across the pond um, is something that we need to get adjusted to. But you know, we have experience with that because you know, we've had a, always a big team. Our part of our technology team is always set in India, and so managing across these different time zones, um, I think, is the is a piece that you know we we want to um, figure out. But I think you know we we will. Would you say, after um, consolidating with Purge, the Razor Group is too big to fail? Nobody is too big to fail. <laughs> Nobody is too. Big. If you have a bad business, you will fail. <laughs> so. Nobody is too uh, big to fail. Um, we, you know, there are things we need to figure out. There are things, uh, you know, there are problem sets we need to we need to solve still. Um, and you know, we have an excellent team to to do so. Um, 
And um, look, right now we are well capitalized um, and uh, we will seize that opportunity while others are not um, and and use that capital judiciously and wisely um, to emerge out of uh, the last leg of the perfect storm as a, a world-class company. So I think there are um, things that we can do. We have time to do now um, that potentially other players don't. Um, and for us, that will um, revolve a lot around, um, you know, the consumer. You know, what can we do on the consumer side? We are very inspired by models like Timu or, you know, as we look to the east, these C2M models, they're very close uh, to suppliers in the supply chain that have very agile supply chains that respond to customer demands very, very fast. Uh, these are um, models that we are very excited by. Um, so actually, we, we don't think about our future as Procter & Gamble uh, of, of the internet. We think that's a very decentralized, fragmented view of the future. It's not like we have 200 brands. That's not how we think about what uh, our business is. Uh, we think about our business more on the supply chain, product innovation, product development, deep integration with the supply chain, um, you know, amazing assortment, amazing price, uh, sort of amazing price value. And value is very important in that equation, not just price. Um, differentiated product uh, providing to Western consumers. That is sort of where where our head is at, and that is sort of what we have executed on very early versus you know most of our peers in the last uh, two years. And the technology that has come uh, around building um, sort of a more centralized, automated business uh, versus a business that has two hundred brands has then allowed us also. That was part of the the equation. Uh, as we thought about, you know, consolidation on the capital side. You know, what we were doing on the consumer, the technology side, how we thought about the business, the nuances about how we thought about the future has been also very helpful and impactful as we had consolidation discussions. Because I think for many of the, the founders that we s spoke to, light bulbs went on. Like, yes, of course, you know, this is a supply chain play. Um, and so our focus very early on you know, to to learn from these Chinese models um, that are really grabbing shares uh, from from important uh, Western e-commerce players, I think has you know will define our 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 journey um, and has defined our journey via consolidation and and people you know em embracing Razor Group and players embracing Razor Group. So, what will be from a current point of view? And knowing that throughout the years this might change, but uh, because you learn new things, you you test things, you build things. Um, what will be the, the the vision for the Razor Group in like five to seven years? You know, five to seven years is um, you know it's is a long time out. You know, we have. I think there are a couple of mega trends within consumer that we are excited by and those guide us as we think about the future um i think one is you know i think the west needs a response uh to players such as timu and Xi'an, which we call c2m vertically integrated businesses so i think a lot of the innovation in commerce e-commerce online commerce um i see in agile supply chains the ability to serve long-tail customer needs having the perfect product for each customer, uh, um, you know, a, a consumer pulled based assortment versus a supplier pushed based uh, assortment. Um, and so, you know, this is, I think, a key element as we think about the future. Uh, another key element uh, for us, and, you know, I'll use the word aggregation again, but, you know, it's important, is that we fundamentally believe that it's more valuable to consumers to have more merchants that are $100 million uh, in size and less merchants that are 2 to $5 million in size. So I'd, th I'd say in a couple of years, maybe Amazon already has that realization. If they don't, they'll hopefully come to the realization, you know, it's probably better to have hundreds of thousands, $100 million uh, merchant uh, on their platform and, you know, Walmart and, and all these other players um, versus millions of 2 to $5 million merchants. Because these larger businesses can be more institutional in what they want to do. They're not about, you know, flipping stuff, making a quick buck, 
And so they will not just arbitrage catalog from Alibaba to, to Amazon to, to make uh, quick money, but they will think about, you know, how can we innovate on product level? Um, how can we inject more capital into the supply chains, value chains? How can we great build ESG compliant product, right? And so, you know, there is a ton of value to having these larger, um, uh, you know, e-commerce players, merchant uh, uh, merchants that, produce better catalog, produce better assortment. I think that is sort of a, another big uh, mega trend that we are excited about. The third big me mega trend that we are excited about is uh, multi-marketplace. So particularly as you think beyond the West, for example, in Latin America, where we are also operating, but also in Asia, yeah, Shopee, Lazada, Coupang, Rakuten, Flipkart. These are all marketplaces Um that will grow in size because the underlying economies are growing rapidly. And so if you, on a global scale, while well, Amazon will continue to be the behemoth that it is, um, on a relative basis, these uh, marketplaces will become more and more and more important. And so we do see our uh, our future, um, you know, in a multi-marketplace world. Well, today, you know, our share of Amazon revenues um are uh, you know have gone down rapidly because our non Amazon revenues have expanded so fast. Uh, Where are the current non Amazon revenues? Is it like online shops? Is it uh, other marketplaces already? Like where is it? So what has worked really well for us is obviously um, you know with the acquisition of uh, Valoreo has been the entire emerging market Mercado Libre channel. In the West, what has surprisingly worked for us. Uh, has been, has been Walmart uh, as a, as a channel that has scaled rapidly. Yeah, um, Target uh, in Europe, Bold.com in the Netherlands. Um, has, you know, it's the the biggest e-commerce channel in the Netherlands, and the Dutch are very rich, uh, so they have uh, you know, it's a very high margin channel for us. Um, so, you know, there are other opportunities in Europe as well. For example, you have Allegro, you have uh, smaller players in in Germany like Otto or um, Kaufland, but essentially, you know, these top four players, uh, Mercado, Walmart, Target, Bull, um, has been a source of uh, a, a lot of growth for us uh, in, in the last couple of quarters. And then lastly, you know, going back to the mega trends, so we, we spoke about rise of Chinese vertical e-commerce, C2M models, supply chain. We spoke about um, consolidation of merchant ecosystem. Yeah, so... I also call that the wrong Darwinism of the marketplace, right? Which is, you know, the idea that a super fragmented merchant ecosystem is more valuable than a more consolidated ecosystem. I think there is, you know, a middle ground uh, where, you know, you have a f you have fragmentation, uh, but you have individually larger merchants that will produce more value than a super hyper fragmented merchant ecosystem through, you know, injection of capital in the supply chain, all the things that we mentioned. Third was um, multi-marketplace. And I'd say the, the fourth mega trend um, that we see in Asia, it has not caught on in the West, um, but it is now increasingly with TikTok shops, is video. Um, and so these are the four mega trends that we are excited about within consumer. And um, I think each one of them... Um, you know, it can be a big enough topic, but I think the combination uh, of the four and, uh, you know, bringing them together thoughtfully is where I see our future more operationally, you know, and uh, you can summarize this. We like to summarize this as the Western response to C2M models like Timu and Sheehan. But, you know, I think it's it's more nuanced than that. Um, yeah. From a marketplace dynamic, I think, um, or I would say that more competition even when it's super fragmented challenges all players to an extent that it still increases um, a lot of value for the for the customer I think you know th that logic obviously is the the simple logic that that would make sense right so in in the economics 101 class more fragmentation means uh, better value to consumers but I think at certain scale, uh, which is, you know, sub $5 million, you can't do the same things as you can do as being a $100 million business. And so what we see actually 
in 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 that segment uh, of of merchant size is that the quality of product that is being sourced is more like stuff flipped from the vendor. So, you know, you go onto Alibaba, you go for the first best product. Um, you contact the vendor, uh, probably sits in China. Um, you source the product and you arbitrage that product to um, to Amazon or Walmart, whatever channel, e-commerce channel that you en- end up uh, using. Now, that arbitraging opportunity, which I call arbitrage Alibaba to Western uh, uh, e-commerce marketplaces, that sort of alpha margin that intelligent entrepreneurs have used in the last 10 years, I think that's that's gone. Um, and so really what you need to focus on is product IP, right? So today, a lot of the product IP through that mechanism of FBA entrepreneurs at scale, you know, getting goods from China and selling them on Amazon lies with lies in China. Um, and so moving that product IP back to the West i.e. the innovation and building an institution around creating great consumer products and injecting the requ- required capital in product development in, um, you know, the required working capital into the supply chain is something that $100 million businesses can do much better and therefore provide much better value to, to end consumer. And so that's why I refer to, I'd say, the, the wrong conclusion of, you know, many is, is better for end consumer as sort of the wrong Darwinism. Um, where uh, a false kind of Darwinism where you say, ah, okay, I have millions of uh, merchants. If that uh, customer doesn't work, I'll just have a, another customer. Uh, sort of, If this merchant doesn't work, I'll just have another uh, merchant killing that merchant providing that same product. But what that results in is really products without innovation. So, you know, what your um, suggestion is, um, results in in the future is just not great consumer products. And we see from our data that actually there is precedent to generate a lot of margin on Amazon. So contrary to common belief, um, I think if you if you find the right PMF, uh, product market fit at product level, um, you know, customers are willing to pay and uh, you're, you're able to build quite profitable um uh, you know, consumer products that, that you can sell uh, to end consumer if they're thoughtful, if they're differentiated, if they have the de- right design element. Um, and so, you know, that's a core focus for us, uh, adding that product IP, adding that design element um, to, to consumer products globally. Just, just to understand uh, the catalog better, how many or approximately how many SKUs do you have in Razor Group? Uh, so we are retailing globally probably you know, 40,000 different uh, products. Does it mean that you have to find the right level of product innovation and product market fit for like 40,000 individual products? No, you know, I think, you know, within the catalog, obviously you have uh, products that are, you know, it's it's sort of similar to to retail uh, where... um, you know, obviously we're a tech business, but you know, you you can draw learnings from retail, wherein um, you know there is a a fat head um, that is generating a lot of the um, uh, you know the EBITDA um, and and the revenues, and then there is sort of a long tail of product um, that you know you could use to innovate to test. Some of them are at the end of the product life cycle, so. Um, you know, managing this forty thousand SKUs, you know that that happens through technology and automation, um, and so technology and automation is a key requirement to operating these businesses and keep on also consolidating our peers if we choose to. Um, at this stage, you know, we we may not choose to. I think we have now reached really um, a, a, a a comfortable spot from where we may just uh, focus on driving our C two M strategy. Yeah, so. Um, yeah. Additionally, I would say, like, uh, nothing to do with yeah. your SKUs, more on the, because we talked about product quality. When I look at Temu and, and Shein, and mm-hmm. then we can definitely uh, question if uh, their model provides the best uh, quality for consumers at the moment. Yeah. So the question is, how do you plan on uh, adapting uh, or, or, or finding the answer to what? those companies are doing by yeah. providing better quality. 
So I think, you know, there are things that co companies like Timu and Shein are obviously not as good at, but the, what is undeniable is that they're grabbing market share. Yeah, it's undeniable. Um, and that is not just a consequence of higher marketing spend. Uh, and, and um, you know, they're doing something fundamentally different um, that global capital is finding their ways to cap tables of these companies, uh, including one of the, you know, most sophisticated uh, or the most sophisticated investors globally, such as Sequoia. Uh, China has probably invested in Xi'an. I'm not sure if they are, but, you know, 80% guess they are. Um, <clears throat> so what are these companies doing different? Um, and, you know, where is opportunity to beat these companies? So I definitely think sort of in, you know, in the last mile, in the uh, sort of product quality, uh, um, sort of being perceived uh, or being uh, uh, sort of more compliant, um, you know, and just being higher quality, I think is a, is an area where probably they have still not done such a such a great job, and it's an it's an area of uh, opportunity to improve for somebody like Razor Group. But where they are doing an amazing job, and you know we just need to appreciate that um, is you know their core strength is is in supply chain uh, and uh, sort of response times, um, product innovation cycles, um, understanding what customers want, um, and then providing customers with what they want. I always like to say internally, think about a landing page where you can just serve the exact product that a customer wants in that point uh, of time. And that is sort of, um, uh, you know, something that, you know, we take inspiration from. Obviously, we are a much smaller player than Shein and Temu today. Pinduoduo, the holding company of Temu, is one of the largest e-commerce companies in the world. Probably a crazy case study that we meet, need to learn from. Um, I think it's good to learn also from the East, not only from the West. Um, but, you know, overall, that's something that we're excited by. There are obviously things that they're doing not as great, and there is a perception um, and probably founded in reality uh, of of drawbacks of, of these Chinese players. Um, but there are great things that they do that we need to learn from and things that they're not as good at, you know, we need to see if we can improve them. And then, you know, we have a, we, we have a shot in the West to, you know, build something similar or even different and, and uh, beat them. Quick addition to the Xi'an cap table, Sequoia Capital China, General Atlantic, Tiber Glo yeah, Tiger, so, Tiger Global so, Management, yeah. um, IDG Capital, Jeffco yeah. Asia, and Greenwood's Asset Management. Yeah. So therefore, I think they raised more than $4 billion. Yeah. Um, So here so, you have it. So, you know. One more question, I think, uh, one of the last points that we will, we will no. cover, but... Um, you have 40,000 SKUs. You bought like a lot of different brands uh, mm -hmm. throughout the mm -hmm. years. Um, either you bought the brand directly or you bought um, other companies that bought many brands. So mm -hmm. you have like a lot of different brands. You could do pretty much like in quotation marks, the everything brand and call it like Razor and sell okay. everything under Razor or mm -hmm. build different sub brands and or you let all of them be the single brands that they were. Mm -hmm. How do you think about the brand strategy for the future? So brand is very important uh, because brand allows us to cater to consumers in a better way. And P&L is just a consequence of that. I don't like brand because it means better margin. I like brands because it serves customer needs better. It you know provides a signal. However, as we sort of connect the idea of brand to our roll-up, 2021 roll-up, strategy and also now consolidation, I think what players around the space need to realize uh, and are increasingly realizing is that the FBA assets that we acquired, um, you know, some of them are brands. A large portion of those are not brands. Um, and so I would rather title the FBA assets that we acquired as catalog uh, of products of products with high PMF product market fit because they're selling at immense scale. Customers love them versus other products. So there's immense customer love for those products. And some of the FBA assets that we acquired obviously are brands where actually you have 
uh, customers searching on Amazon for the brand name and then making the purchase versus searching for a non-branded uh, keyword and then making the purchase based on sort of superiority of product. Um, our brand strategy um, is, you know, as we develop the C2M retail machine, which is more centralized versus a Procter & Gamble. A Procter & Gamble is not as centralized uh, as, as a Procter & Gamble. And that's why I don't like the, the comparison to Procter & Gamble because Procter & Gamble is like 10 brands uh, that are each billions of dollars in scale. Their biggest uh, sort of capability is top of funnel marketing. Um, our biggest capability is supply chain, value chain, innovation, product. So... You know, I think the company that we orient ourselves, that we get inspiration from, are the are the Chinese companies on the supply chain side. Maybe not on the consumer side. You know, in the perception of of quality, etc. That's something that I think we can do much better uh, versus versus those players. But certainly on the supply chain side. Um, so I would argue that yeah. uh, that um, Braun, for example, owned by Procter and Gamble, is very good on the product side as well. Yeah, they're obviously, so, but so they're, they, they're they have an amazing no, for sure, for sure they're, product they're, brands. No, but what you know, what I no, but there is a difference because for Brown, it's just essentially one SKU, uh, one product with different variations, right? Um, and so the supply chain capability required to um, have Brown on the supply chain side is very standardized. You always need the same sort of components. The supply chain capability that you need for a business like Razor with 40,000 different SKUs with ASPs from 15 to $50 yeah, versus Brown, I don't know, is $100 or $200 maybe, you know, th that kind of range. And the width of the, the catalog and the different kind of products is an entirely different supply chain capability. Every sales price, yeah, it's an entirely different supply chain capability. So while you could say, yes, they're great at product, of course they're great at product. Otherwise, why you know they need to be great at product, not just marketing. But their key capability is the customer communication piece, and then you know supply chain piece is their product piece sort of meets what they communicate. But it's sort of like it's marketing top of funnel storytelling first, right? Um, and for us, you know, it is you know automating a behemoth of a supply chain, um, and that is our key differentiated as we look towards the future. Notice how we're not speaking about M&A at all right now. Right? And those are the co conversations I'd love to have. Um, you know, and I hope increasingly in the next couple of quarters and years, we can speak about consumer supply chain product uh, more than the next consolidation. I think aggregation, again, is a strategy. Consolidation is a strategy. Consolidation has been a response to um, the, the market environment, which for every e-commerce company uh, has been what it is. Um, but our future um, and, you know, consumer consumer will be the happy child again. I can guarantee you. I don't know when it's going to be for capital markets. Is it a year, two years, uh, half a year? Um, I don't know. Consumers is going to be the happy child again. And when it does, you know, we'll, we'll have a, you know, large scale business with uh, amazing consumer products. Um, we'll be the only response to Timu and Xi'an. And who knows, maybe we'll reach the end consumer via video commerce as well at some point, right? So this is sort of uh, uh, the vision uh, we, we are executing towards. Certainly have the time to execute uh, to, towards that vision, and I think we're making great progress. I think that's a good point to end the conversation. I am very thankful that you took the time for coming to the show and uh, explaining all of your thoughts, experiences, and... Um, Great to see or or hear more than just headlines that are written by by some people assuming stuff. So having somebody who explains a lot of thoughts um, makes it easier to have your own opinion. And yeah, I think um, probably we will find some time at some point to discuss how the products and supply chain innovations are going onward and how it's how it's developing. So I wish you all the best for the future. And thank you, thank you for having um, me. Of course, I'll link to to your LinkedIn uh, yeah. in the show notes. But happy to hand over the last words of the podcast that you can. So I mean, um, you know, 
First of all, thank you for having me. Thank you for having this podcast in English. Uh, I'm sure that you know everybody at Razor will appreciate if they can actually follow what we're discussing. Um, even you know a, a large part of our people in the Berlin office uh, are probably English first. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, third, I'd say, look, you know, we we discussed sort of uh, the entrepreneurial journey uh, with capital, without capital. There is no one size uh, fits it all answer. I think everybody has to figure out based on context of their own context uh, what path they want to go on. Sometimes paths are open, sometimes they're not. Um, I just, if a door is open that you that you feel great about, go through that door. I think that's probably the advice that uh, I can give. There are not many doors in life, um, and so um, you know how you make that decision with whether that's analysis or gut or whatever. Um, you know, I think if there is a great door, take that door, whether that's with capital or without capital, you know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's just take that door, move forward, progress and become a better person and build great businesses. Tushar, thank yeah. you so much. Great. Thank you. Yeah.